Good morning, everybody. We are at a crucial moment in this city, a crucial moment in our fight against the coronavirus. Now, for seven months, this city's waged a battle, and I want to say to all of you, New Yorkers have been heroic in this struggle, fighting back against the coronavirus consistently. Now we have a challenge. We see a rise in cases in certain parts of our city, and we have to get ahead of this. We have to bring everything to bear we can. We have to be tough about it. And that's why I put forward a plan to address the situation. And yes, it involves tough restrictions, nothing we want to do, but the kind of thing we need to do and do quickly to get ahead of the problem to keep this problem limited, to address it in a matter of weeks and not let it spread further. So look, we know so much more now than we did at the beginning of this struggle. Back in March and April when we had so little testing, when we had so much less knowledge about this disease, our fight was very, very difficult and yet this city did fight back and get to a much better place. Now we have the advantage of much more knowledge, much more testing, much more understanding amongst the people of the city of what they have to do, and they've shown it time and time again. These realities should be great advantages as we fight back these specific problems in specific areas. But again, it will all come down to you, to everyday New Yorkers doing the right thing for yourselves, for your families, for your communities, by practicing the basic rules, the basic vision that has worked for us over and over again the wearing the mask, the social distancing, just doing the smart, basic things that if everyone does them together, we turn the tide in our favor. So let's give you a picture now of what's happening right now in this city. We have a new map that provides a sense of where the challenges are, where the hot spots are. And right now, again, we have nine zip codes where we have seen the positivity level for the coronavirus above 3% for seven consecutive days. It remains nine zip codes. Then we have our watch list, and that's tier two where we're watching areas that are in danger of entering that top tier of particularly troubled zip codes. We have a new zip code we're adding to that watch list, and that is 11206 South Williamsburg. That brings the watch list total to 13. So again, we're staying stable with nine. In the top category where we need the most action, the most restrictions, 13 that are being watched. And those 13 do not need to end up in that top category. They do not need to experience those deeper restrictions. So you can see the number of days consecutive over 3%, thank God, not yet into that category. But we're warning people in those communities to really buckle down, to take all the right precautions, to take it seriously. You do not want to see these restrictions in your community. You can do something about it. You don't want to see small businesses closed in your neighborhood. You can do something about it. Right now, there is time to turn things around. That's why we're providing this information to the public in an urgent manner. So. In terms of the nine zip codes, uh, I've proposed, I think, the way forward, clear, sharp restrictions applied quickly. Now, obviously, with our schools in the nine high-risk uh, zip codes, those schools, both public and non-public, are closed as of this morning. Uh, this will be for several weeks. The faster we address the problem on the ground, the faster the community participates, the quicker we can get those schools open again in as little as two weeks, hopefully no more than four weeks but we all have a lot of work to do. Now again, we chose to close the schools out of an abundance of caution. Thankfully, in our school system, including in the affected zip codes, tier one, tier two, we are not seeing any unusual problems, anything out of the ordinary in our schools, thank God. And we continue to do testing outside of schools and in schools in those affected zip codes, testing teachers, staff, watching for problems, I'll give you an example. Just the last few days, we've gotten 1,351 test results from 35 schools in those nine top zip codes, and only two positive tests among the 1,351 results we've gotten so far. So, again, excuse me, our educators, our staff, school communities are doing a great job. They're doing the right thing. They're being smart about things. Folks understand the hand washing, the hand sanitizer, the social distancing, the face mask. If sick, they're staying home. People are doing this the right way, and it proves, it's proven by the testing we're seeing at our schools. We're going to keep that testing going in the 13 zip codes on the watch list constantly, moving from school to school each day, 
uh, to keep a clear picture on what's going on. Now, the plan related to the nine zip codes, obviously presented at the state. We had conversations yesterday morning. I spoke with the governor and our teams have been talking throughout the day yesterday. Constructive conversations, productive conversations are gonna continue into this morning. And we need obviously a clear decision in the course of today so we can move forward. The, the plan I've presented is the template to address this. Uh, the state is looking at that template. We understand it's their ultimate decision. They can modify as they see fit. But the important thing is to come to a decision quickly so we can get going. We are prepared to implement as soon as tomorrow morning in those nine zip codes once we have the sign off from the state. Now in the meantime, again, what everyone can do, you're going to have this constant question, how long do these restrictions have to be in place? And I'm gonna be talking to a lot of people in the community, I have been already, and my message is the same. You can keep it to a matter of weeks, but everyone has to participate. Everyone has to be part of the solution. If we all do this right, which we did before, in much tougher circumstances, we contain this problem to a limited part of the city for a limited period of time. Then we reopen in those places and keep moving forward. If we do it wrong, it keeps spreading into surrounding zip codes and then endangers the whole city. We cannot let that happen. So everyone has to be part of the solution. Now today is a Tuesday, and as always, we talk about testing on Tuesday. Get tested Tuesday. Look again, what works? Testing, testing, testing. We can say it you know, so many times, you cannot say it enough times, because there's still a huge number of New Yorkers who have never been tested even once. It helps this whole city to get tested because it gives us a picture of what's going on and helps us understand where our challenges are and what to do about them. So again, if you have never been tested, please go get tested right away. If you haven't been tested in a long time, please go get tested. It is fast, it's easy. We need New Yorkers, not just in those nine zip codes or in those 13 on the watch list, but everywhere to get tested. The faster we get the truth, the faster we can act. Now, everybody, we're expanding testing capacity throughout the city, constantly getting it where it's needed most. But remember, we have over 200 sites all over the city. Everyone has a place near them, always free, always quick. If you want to know where to go, just go online, nyc.gov slash COVID test for locations or call 212-COVID-19. And again, all testing is free. Now, I mentioned the importance of testing at schools. We've been doing the testing of staff and educators outside schools and in schools. Starting uh, later this week, we're going to be starting the systematic medical monitoring of schools all over the city. We'll be doing that for every school once a month for the duration of this crisis. And we, it's a way that we get more information, get to watch carefully what's happening, keep everyone safe. This begins in some schools this Friday. We want to make sure that everyone is participating. That means educators, staff, it means uh, students, everyone. Now, obviously, educators and staff are overwhelmingly uh, ready, willing, and able to get tested. But we need a sign-off form. We need a consent form from parents to get a kid tested at their school. So families can now complete the consent form online. You go to your NYC school account, and you get that at mystudent.nyc. So just go to mystudent.nyc, your own account, enter in the information on the consent form that automatically makes sure the school knows that your child can be tested. And look, to all the parents out there, I'm a parent, I wanna say this to all of you, this is such a good and smart thing to do. The school community is working very closely with the Department of Health and the Test and Trace team to make sure everyone is tested, tested quickly, safely, obviously for free. It's a great way to know what is going on in the school and keep everyone safe. You will get the results for your own child. Now, this is a random sample in the sense of it's not every child every month. Certain children some month, other children another month. But whenever there is a test of your child, you'll get those results quickly. And that's important for your peace of mind. So all families should participate and sign up on that consent form. Uh, the school will be reaching out to you about it as well if you have any questions or concerns. And obviously, we'll talk to people in whatever language they speak to help them understand how this works and to encourage them to sign that form. Now, families always have questions about testing, want to know more, want to know how it works. Is it fast? Yes. Is it safe? Yes. Is it quick and easy for your child, not too cumbersome, not too difficult for your child? 
Yes, but we want to not just tell you that, we want to show you that. So we've put together a video with one of our health and hospitals pediatricians and a young volunteer to give you a sense of how things will work. Let's look at the video. Do you know what we're doing today? Yeah, COVID testings. Yeah, so I wanted to show you what's in the test. Hi, I'm Dr. Katie Punica Worms, a pediatrician with New York City Health and Hospitals. As a doctor for our city's children, I know that keeping our kids healthy means keeping our schools safe from COVID-19. That's why, together with our partners at the New York City Health Department, the New York City Department of Education, and the New York City Test and Trace Corps, we're bringing COVID-19 testing to schools to keep our students safe and our classrooms open. Starting this month, we will test a random sample of staff and students from first graders all the way to 12th graders in school one day a month. The COVID-19 test is free, safe, and easy, and results are returned within 48 hours. We will only test students whose parents or legal guardians have given consent. So reminder to all families, sign and return your consent form as soon as possible. Let's work together to keep our school communities healthy. For more information, visit schools.nyc.gov slash COVID testing. All right, well, thank you, first of all, to Dr. Katie and all our colleagues at Health and Hospitals and everyone who's gonna be part of the school testing program. That uh, video really says it all. And look, parents, I wanna to say to you, as you can see our, our very energetic young volunteer there, had a cool hairstyle too, that he uh, did not have a problem with that test because it's not the long instrument they used to use. It is the much shorter, simpler, just a quick, rub around the inside of the nostril and it collects the sample really easily, really quickly. I've had this newer kind of test. It is much better, much simpler. That's what we'll be providing the kids and it's as quick and easy as you just saw there. Now, let's talk, since we're talking about kids, we're talking about schools, let's talk about what we need to do to make sure the kids continue to be educated during this pandemic. Now, that we have our whole school system open, our buildings open. Uh, we have kids in classrooms. We have kids obviously in the blended approach where they're in class part of the week at home working online for the rest of the week and other kids in all remote. But what does it require? It requires that every child has the technology they need. Now in the spring, there was an absolutely astounding effort to get technology in the hands of kids who needed it, an emergency effort that was really admirable, and I commend everyone at the DOE and all the partners in the private sector who helped make that possible. 350,000 iPads were distributed beginning in March. And it was one of the greatest efforts to address the digital divide in this city's history. Overall, the Department of Education has 950,000 remote learning devices available for students. Some obviously uh, are kept in schools, others are given to kids to take home. Uh, that supply has been uh, extraordinary and has reached so much of our needs, but we still have an additional need for 100,000 more iPads according to the surveys we've taken uh, from parents and families. So the additional 100,000 iPads are being procured now. They will be provided to students starting next month. And again, any student who still needs an iPad will get one or if their iPad broke or there's any problem, we'll replace it. We need the remote learning, whether it's part of the week or all week for a child to work. We need them to make sure, we need to make sure they get the technology they need and we will. Okay, let's go to our indicators now for the whole city. Indicator number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19 threshold is 200 patients. Today's report is 70 with a confirmed positivity rate for COVID of 21.4%. Number two, new reported cases on a seven day average threshold is 550 cases. Today's report, 501 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19 threshold is 5%. Today's report, 1.90%. And the seven day rolling average today is 1.65%. Few words in Spanish. Estamos viendo un aumento grave de coronavirus en ciertas áreas de Brooklyn y Queens. Necesitamos que todos los neoyorquinos luchemos 
juntos contra esta pandemia, usando máscaras, manteniendo la distancia social y tomando la prueba, incluso si no hay síntomas. La prueba nos ayudará a detener el aumento del coronavirus y es gratis, segura y fácil. Llame al 311 para encontrar un sitio de prueba cerca de su casa. With that, we'll turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Hi, all. We'll now begin our Q&A. We're joined today by Health Commissioner Dr. Dave Chachki, Health and Hospital CEO Dr. Mitchell Katz, Schools Chancellor Richard Carranza, Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma, and Jeff Tamkatesim, Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. With that, we'll go to Gloria from New York One. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, how are um, you doing? Good, thank you. I wanted to ask you about uh, something that the governor said yesterday, and I want to get your reaction because I believe there's a little bit of confusion going around. Um, and I saw that you mentioned the amount of testing uh, that have been done at schools that are in the cluster zip codes. Part of what the governor said yesterday was that the virus transmits, and that's a direct quote from him, in, in schools because uh, different communities come together in schools and therefore it is a place of transmission. I'm wondering if I can get you to weigh in on that as well as the medical experts on the line about whether or not the city believes that schools are a problem as it pertains to the spread of the virus. Let me start and I'll turn to uh, Dr. Varma and Dr. Choksi. Uh, Gloria, that's not what we're seeing. Uh, we're going by the facts, we're going by the data. We've had the situation room up now for most of a month. Uh, literally every single day reviewing data from every single school, 1,600 schools in the school system. All reports of potential coronavirus being uh, followed up on. And on top of that, uh, targeted testing initiatives at the schools. What we're seeing uh, in the school system in general is a very low level of coronavirus activity. Now, I'm going to tell you the facts I know, but I want to start with the why. Why would that be? Because the schools are now uh, so concentrated in terms of the safety and health measures. What we're doing, we've talked about this gold standard we set. Just think about everywhere in the city, everywhere in your life. Here we have a place where everyone is wearing a mask scrupulously. I've seen this with my own eyes from the youngest child to the oldest educator. Everyone's wearing a mask together. Everyone's practicing social distancing. Nine, 10 kids in a classroom. We've never seen anything like that in New York City history. Cleaning constantly, ventilation, you name it. All of these approaches layered on top of each other. Uh, that makes it a particularly safe location uh, clearly, folks who are not feeling well, staying home, been a lot of testing before school began, there will continue to be more testing. What we saw with the uh, tens of thousands of educators and staffs that, staff that we have tested so far was a positively level below one half of one percent. So the facts keep coming in, and I told you this recent batch of tests at schools in the nine zip codes, 1,351 tests of educators and staff came back with only two positives. So I think the schools are proving to be very safe to the credit of everyone at DOE, everyone at Test and Trace and Department of Health, and this is what we want to continue because this is crucial to the future of the city is to keep our school system safe. So Dr. Varma, Dr. Choksi, would you offer your reflections? Sure, I can. I can start. I, yeah, I think the mayor actually covered everything, you know, quite comprehensively. Uh, we need to remember that we have many lines of defense to keep our schools safe. Um, we actually have lines of defense that are very similar to what you would have in, in a healthcare facility. You know, and you know, we have people wearing masks. We have people maintaining physical distance. We have extensive hand hygiene. We have environmental cleaning, and then of course we have guidance that's being followed up and tested that people um, stay home and avoid going to school if they have any symptoms of illness. Those are critical lines of defense, and it's not just New York City. We have seen evidence from everywhere around the world that this is a disease that if people take the appropriate precautions, 
and the institution enforces compliance with those precautions, our kids can get an education and our teachers and staff can remain safe. Uh, that is incontrovertible. I know an issue that keeps coming up also is about testing. You know, I'm a, I'm a real zealot when it comes to testing because I think it's absolutely critical to controlling our epidemic around the city, and we have evidence from that from around the world. Uh, but testing, again, isn't our first line of defense in the city. It's that what we're instituting is a medical monitoring program because it's going to help us understand how much undiagnosed infection is there and are our prevention measures working the way they should. So I just wanted to, to make sure that we, we highlight and understand where testing falls in the hierarchy of those lines of defense. Dr. Choksi. Nothing to add to what's already been said, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Doctor. Go ahead, Gloria. Okay, thank you. And if I could, uh, Mr. Mayor, ask you about this uh, back and forth regarding the non-essential businesses. It seems like there is a disagreement about whether or not the city should do this uh, by zip code. The governor seemed to suggest yesterday this was a flawed approach. You know, the, the virus doesn't travel by zip code. It does not recognize zip code. So uh, do you have an understanding of what the governor's uh, uh, problem is with your plan? And are you working on that? And do you think that maybe there is a way to do this uh, that isn't just zip code focused since there is a recognition that, yes, people do move around, that people are not confined to one specific area uh, or, or zip code, and that there may be there's a, a smarter way of doing this. I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Choksi. Look, we obviously, over the last few days, talked through different models. Um, the governor had an impulse that I shared to say, was there some way to, for example, use census tracts? We found that to be not as helpful as I would have liked because we saw again that we had not only within a zip code particular high levels, but we saw it starting to spread to the other areas of the zip code. So the idea here is to, of course, focus on the places that are having the toughest situation, but also surround them with activity to make sure that we do not allow spread. So if you are restricting in the places that are really, really the toughest, you also want restrictions in the immediate surrounding perimeter. And that's why the zip code model, actually, the more I looked at it, the more sense it made. It was a way to stop the spread from going into more and more neighborhoods. And zip code has the advantage, Gloria, that it's not something like everyone knows what the zip code is of every building that they go to or every school or whatever, but it's easy to find out. People certainly know their own household zip code. It's easy to find out if your store, if your school are in that zip code or not. And that was an advantage compared to other demographic or geographic measures we might use. As to uh, the governor's team, they, again, good conversations yesterday. They'll continue today. We're looking forward to a decision today. Uh, best of my understanding, they did not present a specific alternative. I said, look, here's what I propose. This would work. We all understand what the zip code is. This would work. Let's go. We have to act decisively. If they have a different model, uh, it's their call. And we'll work whatever model they choose, but we have to move quickly. Dr. Choksi. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Just to add briefly to, um, to what you've said, uh, what we have to do is match up the epidemiology of the virus, you know, understanding how it is transmitted, uh, the speed with which that spread can happen with the practical considerations uh, around um, how to implement these um, these difficult local restrictions. Uh, and, you know, that's how um, our team has landed on uh, the zip codes as the best um, geographic way to uh, to set the boundaries for what we're um, moving forward with. I'll say two more things. One is that um, we know that we have to move swiftly, uh, that um, you know this, this virus is such a formidable foe. Uh, and so um, the plans that we uh, have proposed to the state uh, are, are meant to be able to uh, be brought into action as quickly as possible. And the second point is just to emphasize one thing that the mayor said, which is that we have been in dialogue with uh, our counterparts at the state, including health officials uh, at the state level, to explain our reasoning, um, you know, to explain why it is that we uh, selected uh, the particular zip codes that are of greatest concern. 
Um, and I think there is a, a lot of shared understanding about the urgency of the situation. We're also joined by Dr. Ted Long, Executive Director of the Tests and Trace Corps. With that, we'll move on next to Jen from the AP. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, Jen. How you doing? Fine, thanks. I guess my first question would be, um, have the hospitals at all started to prepare for a potential surge in patients? Are any of those plans being reactivated? Yeah, I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Katz. Um, Jen, what we're seeing so far, and you know, we obviously are very careful and cautious in our assumptions. What we're seeing so far is actually the number of hospitalizations has not moved much, although the positivity levels for the coronavirus have increased, but um, still low compared to what they were in the past. So meaning within among the uh, folks who are in the hospital. But we certainly have to be ready for a higher level of hospitalizations. I, I would say right now, if this is our starting point, we're in a much mother, better place than we were obviously in the spring because whatever is happening now has not moved very quickly in terms of hospitalizations. But yeah, we have to be ready in case of any scenario. So go ahead, Dr. Katz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The 11 hospitals of health and hospitals have been a great barom barometer of the city activity for COVID. Uh, we saw many of the trends ahead of anyone else in the last round. I'm very pleased that right at the moment, there are only two patients in the 11 hospitals who currently are on a ventilator due to COVID. So it is very low. But we nonetheless, of course, have plans for how we would deal with the surge if it were to happen. Every single hospital based on its experience of what worked and frankly, what didn't work in March and April has a new plan. We know with detail what wards we would open, who would get, who would staff those wards, what the correct order of it, how we would uh, transport patients. There was a tremendous amount that was learned in, in uh, dealing with the epidemic in March and April and we'll be prepared if there is another surge. Go ahead, Jen. Um, I also wondered whether this is a bit of an offbeat question, I guess, but in trying to refine strategies for containing this latest flare up, has any thought been given to tailoring restrictions by some factor other than geography, such as people's level of risk, like age group? Jen, I'll start. And I'll turn to Dr. Varma and Dr. Choksi. Um, I think one of the things we learned last time, obviously a really, really bad situation in March and April, but we learned a couple of things. Uh, move as fast as you can, be decisive. It's much better to put too many restrictions in place and solve the problem quickly than to delay putting restrictions in place. So uh, I think when you parse too much, just as a common sense matter, uh, when you parse too much, you run the risk of too many avenues being left open for the spread of the disease. I think if you say, let's really buckle down for a concentrated period of time, again, weeks, if done right, um, and make sure you're grabbing the whole area that needs to be addressed, you have a much better chance of stopping this problem in its tracks before it reaches the rest of the city. That, that's my layman's interpretation. But Dr. Varma, Dr. Choksi, you want to speak to that? Sure, thanks. I, I think you know, the mayor has summarized it, it quite well. Uh, these restrictive social measures are a bit of a blunt instrument. Uh, we reserve them for only situations where our individual measures and our testing and tracing can't keep up with epidemic spread. And they have to be applied um, in an area broader than we might like, uh, just simply because of, of the complexity of, of how societies work and people interact. What you're asking specifically about is an approach that, um, in public health terms, they use the term shielding or cocooning, which is, is it possible to have the most vulnerable people um, kind of avoid um, high-risk activities and, and, in a way, quarantine themselves um, so that people who are at lower risk can continue their activity? You know, that, that has a lot of theoretical strength to it. 
Uh, but the practical experience uh, from many places in, in Europe that attempted this early on um, has, has really not borne out. And that's because we are all connected to each other. Uh, if you're, uh, let's say, elderly and you have medical conditions, uh, you need people to help you, and those people are in connection to other people. So you are really just one or two degrees of separation from other people, and it's really not uh, very effective to try to shield a very large population this way. Dr. Choksi? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for this um, very good question. I'll just add briefly um, to say, number one, it's absolutely right that geography matters. Um, we, we know this from our experience with the coronavirus uh, globally. Uh, geography does matter, and that's why uh, the plan that we have proposed um, focuses on, uh, on geography in that way. Um, but in addition to what Dr. Varma said, um, there are other ways, you know, that are not mutually exclusive with uh, thinking about geography as a way to address risk, um, particularly, you know, higher risk uh, settings, um, whether it's a healthcare setting, you know, a nursing home, uh, or other areas where um, we know, you know, there are higher risk activities, particularly things that occur uh, indoors. Um, those are also places where we can bring to bear uh, additional ways to uh, protect people in those higher risk settings. Um, you know, ensuring that uh, that the uh, bread and butter of our um, prevention strategies, you know, the so-called core four, um, are are practiced and adhered to, um, in particular, in those settings. Next up is Henry from Bloomberg. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? Good, Henry. How are you? I'm okay. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, the students who are in these affected areas can still go to schools outside the affected areas, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And if so, does that create an elevated risk? I'll tell you what I think, and uh, Dr. Choksi can jump in after me. I do not believe, Henry, I do not believe it creates an elevated risk for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is that we see uh, the schools taking extraordinary uh, measures to keep kids and staff safe, and it's working. So if kids will be going into a very safe environment, and remember the second factor, the screening. We're telling every parent it is their obligation to screen their child every day. If there's symptoms, your child stays home. If there's a temperature, your child stays home. If you get to, the kid gets to school and there's a temperature, the child goes to isolation, is sent home. So there really are safeguards to ensure that if an individual child uh, is even symptomatic, that uh, that is addressed right away. Dr. Choksi? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, I would just um, briefly emphasize, you know, particularly uh, today as Get Tested Tuesday, um, we do have a, a simple and clear message for uh, for anyone uh, who lives in, in the affected areas uh, in particular, which is to get tested immediately, um, whether you're a student or uh, someone else uh, who's in that zip code. Um, and we think that will also add uh, the layer of protection, uh, as the mayor mentioned. Go ahead, Henry. Um, okay, so I mean, thank you for the for answering that. Um, my other question has to do with um, bear with me here for a second. Um, the I kind of lost it, but let me let me see if I can. <laughs> we can we can bring you back if you want. All right, bring me back in about a minute or you two. You got it. Thank you. Yep. Next up is Derek from WABC. Hi, good morning. I, I had a question about this uh, incident that happened last night in Borough Park, the warehouse where the FDNY was seen sawing their way inside, reports of 500 people inside. And then it's our understanding that uh, despite some fire safety violations, uh, there were no summonses issued for violating any of the you know COVID-19 orders. Uh, could you talk about that? Should there have been summonses issued in that situation? Derek, I am waiting to get the full details. I've only gotten a basic report this morning. 
The most important fact here is, first of all, there never should have been a gathering like that, and the folks who organized it uh, did something harmful, and that has to be addressed, and we'll address it certainly in terms of those individuals. Um, second, the important point, the FDNY got there to address the situation and disperse people. But in terms of summonses and other consequences, I'll get you an update on that. Obviously, something like that cannot happen, particularly in the middle of a crisis where certain zip codes are uh, showing a, a particularly high level of this disease and it's a danger to everyone. People have to be smart to not let something like that happen and there will obviously be consequences. Go ahead. And then my second question is related to schools. You had mentioned a, a short time ago that just a couple of coronavirus cases are linked to the schools. I think you said two out of 1,300 tests were positive in those nine zip codes. And so based on that information, uh, why go ahead and shut down the schools if by your own admission, you know, people are following the rules, they're wearing masks. If there's, if there's very few cases in the schools, then why close the schools? Yeah, Derek, it's a very fair question. This is an imperfect reality, obviously. Um, the fact is, across the whole city, the schools are doing a tremendous job and the numbers bear it out. And it is striking testing you know, staff and educators in the nine zip codes at that level, 1,300 tests plus, and getting only one positive back or two positives back. I mean, that's amazing. So um, in a perfect world, we'd say, hey, let's just keep things going. But I think the reality is if we're really trying to restrict movement and activity within the zip code, if we say here are nine zip codes out of 146 in New York City that are particularly problematic, we really want to bring the level of activity down. So let's close the public and non-public schools. Let's close the non-essential businesses. Let's encourage people to stay home. Don't go out unless you have to go out. Go back to the reality we had more in the spring, but in a concentrated area. It just stands to reason that even though the schools were doing quite well, we just want to reduce the amount of overall activity for a few weeks, hopefully only, and really stop this spread quickly. We're gonna go back to Henry for his last question. Thank you very much. Actually, that last question and the first question that I asked you pretty much covers the subject of that question. But I have another question for you, which goes back to the continuing theme of uh, the relationship between the city and the state, uh, this governor and your administration, and whether or not this latest uh, split on how to geographically define the areas of risk is another example of how uh, not being on the same page might uh, make this pandemic more problematic. Look, Henry, I think it's pretty straightforward. First of all, again, uh, mayors and governors, not just in New York, but all over the country will have differences. We have different jobs to do different interests look out for. Our, my job is to look out for the people in New York City, nothing else, but my job is to look out for the people in New York City. So right now, I see a problem in Brooklyn and Queens. I want fast action. I want the state to take action because of the emergency status we're in. If we were not in this emergency status, I'd be taking the action myself. Uh, would be ready to do that right away. I also want the state to look out for New York City because there's a larger problem in other parts of the state in the metropolitan area. We see other clusters, whether it's Nassau County, Orange County, Rockland County. I want them acted on for the good of the people in those communities, but also to stop the interplay between different parts of the state that could be exacerbating this crisis. So my job is to look out for the people in New York City. And I think that reality you know, city governments, state governments, federal government often don't see eye to eye, have different worldviews. That's normal. But I think if you ask the question here, where have we ultimately gotten? I think the vast majority of times the city and state have gotten to the right place together. Sometimes we start with different perspectives, but we end up getting where we need to get in the vast majority of cases. So, look, my job here was to put out to the people of the city the reality that it became clear we had a bigger problem that required restrictions. No one likes restrictions, but it was time to say it out loud. My job was to say that to propose action because we need the state's approval. 
state has every right to ask tough questions or look at the model and see if they want to alter the model. That is their right under the law. It's just important they do it quickly and decisively so we can all move forward. So really the proof's in the pudding, Henry. So long as we keep getting somewhere, so long as we keep making the decisions together and getting to results, that's what ultimately matters. Next up is Marsha from WCBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, how are you doing? Good, Marsha, how you been? My first question has to do with um, enforcement. And I know yesterday the governor um, made light of the amount of enforcement that New York City has been doing. And today on New York One, Commissioner Shea was asked about whether he would give uh, stricter rules to the police officers in the communities about um, being strict about giving more more uh, fines and sentences and fines and, and things like that. I wonder if you think that more fines for not mask wearing is something that you should be doing, whether you should step up enforcement, and whether you're going to provide NYPD um, manpower to the governor's task force. Yeah, no, I spoke to that already. Um, you know, last week, Marsha, we had over 1,000 city personnel out in the most affected communities, including NYPD, Sheriff's Office, Office of Special Enforcement, Health Department, Sanitation Department. They were all out doing enforcement as well as doing education and, and mass distribution. It was 400 officers each day uh, last week. We're gonna keep increasing that, and as we have additional zip codes we need to deal with, we'll literally keep increasing as much as we have to. Uh, absolutely, we've been doing enforcement for weeks and weeks. In fact, we've closed down businesses, closed down yeshivas, uh, issued summonses, you name it. But what I think is clear here is this is a problem beyond the normal enforcement approach. This is a problem that requires larger restrictions for the community because we tried in the past uh, and had success in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, in Soundview in the Bronx, in Southeast Queens. We tried an approach that was heavy on outreach, education, mass distribution, concentrated testing, and enforcement wherever needed, and that worked. In this instance, we saw this problem grow, tried the same strategies, tried more enforcement. It was not turning the tide the way it needed to because you can only enforce in so many places at so many times. We're now at the point where we need restrictions, hopefully only for a few weeks to really turn the tide here. Go ahead, I also Mark. wonder, whether, uh, Mr. Mayor, whether there, because there's a lack of secular education in some of these troubling communities, um, that leads to a lack of compliance because they don't have the secular education. Maybe they don't understand it. Do you think there's a correlation between the lack of secular education and the lack of compliance? Uh, I can't. I can't speculate on that, Marcia. I think what we have to do throughout all these zip codes is work with everyone. I mean, we've seen tremendous support from community leaders and community institutions. Uh, we've seen intensive efforts to educate people on the importance of mask wearing, uh, the importance of social distancing. We've seen mass distribution drives. I think there's plenty of good messaging coming from community leaders and institutions telling people how important it is. Uh, I think there are some voices in many communities, not just here in New York City, we're seeing it all around the country. There are some voices telling people not to wear masks, telling them coronavirus is a hoax. You saw a very painful example of that when Dr. Katz and our other healthcare leadership gave a press conference uh, a week or two ago, and it was interrupted by a community resident literally saying the coronavirus is a hoax. So we have some of that out there. But overwhelmingly, the community leadership has sent a message that's very consistent with what our health leadership is saying, and everyone is working together to try and solve this problem. Next up is Juliet from 1010 Wins. Oh, hi. Good morning, all. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, Juliet. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you just said a couple of minutes ago that schools and some of these uh, non-essential businesses might be closed for a few weeks. Uh, what criteria will you use to reopen and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how systematic would, would that criteria have to be maintained 
in order for everything to reopen? Yeah, it's a very important question, Juliet. I appreciate it. Look, what we tend to see with the coronavirus, and I've been trained by our great healthcare leadership here to look for these patterns, that there really are pretty clear patterns. When there's an upswing, it tends to go up over a period of days and weeks. When it starts to turn in the right direction, you also see that emerge over a period of days and weeks. So the two-week scenario is the ideal. And I'm not saying it's likely, but it's the ideal. It's the one we want everyone to shoot for, where from the moment the restrictions go into place, uh, two weeks later, uh, you can come out of the restrictions if the full two weeks has passed and the last seven consecutive days, that zip code was under 3% positivity seven days in a row. That would indicate a trend, obviously. And that's where we'd be comfortable lifting the restrictions. Now, again, all this is ultimately the decision of the state of New York. But I'm going to keep being very vocal about what we think will work and what we need. We want those restrictions to just be as long as they need to be, not a day more. So that's the ideal scenario. The other scenario we put forward is a 28-day scenario, four weeks, where if you can't meet that first standard, second standard is go four weeks. If by the last day, the 28th day, you're down below 3%, Again, that should show us that enough of the trouble has passed that we can lift the restrictions. Now, Juliet, people have to take this seriously. If they don't do the work, if the people in every community don't do the work, it could go on longer, and no one wants that. So ideally, with a lot of you know, buckling down, a lot of uh, real teamwork and effort by people in communities, you can get this done in just a few weeks, maybe more like three, four weeks, but our goal is weeks and then get the restrictions off. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, also, has anyone in these zip codes, in the nine zip codes, has anyone been given a summons for not wearing a mask? Yeah, we'll get you those numbers. As I said, there's been a whole range of summons activity and enforcement activity, whether it is yeshivas that were shut down, stores that were shut down, people who were given uh, summonses for not wearing a mask or anything else. But remember, this is an area where we've been adamant because we know it works. The goal is to change behavior. Never ever wanted to penalize for the sake of penalizing. We've wanted to change behavior. We distribute the masks. If people take the mask and wear the mask, that's what we care about. If someone refuses, that's gonna be a penalty right away. We're on to our last two. First, we'll go to Narmeen from PIX11. Hi, good morning, Mayor. How you doing? Good, doing well. I, I want to also, um, what Juliet had said, um, we'd also like to see the numbers on the summons and fines in those nine zip codes. So if your office could get that to us, we'd really appreciate it. But I also think that there is maybe some confusion or maybe some clarification needed for city residents about what city inspectors for compliance of things like mask wearing should or does look like. And I wanna give you an example. We were in Borough Park for some time in the vicinity of 14th Avenue and 42nd Street. And our observations showed minimal mask wearing. We drove around about a 10 block radius and we only saw a handful of people maybe wearing masks. When they saw our cameras come out, people would take it out of their pockets and put it on. We did not see NYPD vehicles with those loudspeaker messages that we saw last week. And we didn't see any obvious signs of city officials going around giving those summons. I mean, this seems to be an area that is in clear defiance of what the governor and you are talking about. Look, that's, that's not the way I would define it um, because we have been working with community leaders and community institutions getting a lot of support. We've definitely seen an uptick in mask usage, but it's not where it needs to be. We have had loudspeaker messages out now for the last week or more. We're gonna continue that, of course. Uh, there is a lot of ground to cover. So I respect that you were in a very good location. That's an area I used to represent in the city council. So you chose well. But look, we're talking about nine zip codes. That's a lot of ground to cover. So we have our folks out over a very broad area, getting this message out all the time, taking the enforcement action. But I want to be clear. Again, I think there's a dissonance that has to be addressed very bluntly here. We did all the same measures in a number of communities and it worked and things turned around quickly. Again, Sunset Park, Soundview, Southeast Queens, 
We put out the free mass, we did the education, we did the outreach, we did the intensive testing. We were able to turn the situation quickly. We're not seeing that in these nine zip codes. It's past the point where enforcement solves your problem. So people can keep focusing on enforcement. It, there's a role for enforcement. It's past that point now. The facts on the ground make clear we need restrictions. Enforcement would have worked in, as it did in the other places. If it had worked that same way as it did in the other places, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We need something stronger and we need it quickly. We need restrictions to stop this problem. Go ahead. Mayor, have you found in any of those nine zip codes to be any more challenging when it comes to enforcement for any of your city inspectors? Any ones that stand out that you believe the city has to work maybe harder on? I have not heard that specifically. I think what we've seen is that the more education, the more outreach, yes, we've used those sound trucks, the more messages from community leaders, the more impact it makes. But we are uh, fighting against a situation, as I said, there are some parts of the community where there are negative messages being put out, telling people not to wear masks and that coronavirus is a hoax and all that. We are fighting that problem. Uh, we are fighting the problem of people, of course, having had the fatigue of being through this crisis now for seven months, and that's understandable. It's hard to keep your guard up for so long. But what we do know is more and more we're getting support and help from all facets of the community. And that restrictions, unlike any of these other uh, tools, restrictions are crystal clear. If non-essential businesses are closed, if public and non-public schools are closed, it's really obvious if someone is violating and you can take instant action on that. Uh, that's the kind of measure we need now. For our last question, we'll go to Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hi, I wanted to ask, uh, coming off the businesses question, I know yesterday you said that you would close non-essential businesses. It's contrary to what the governor and the state, uh, what the governor said he wants to do. So if the governor does not approve the city's plan to close non-essential businesses in these nine zip codes, will the city still move forward and enforce the closure of these businesses? So Katie, I've been really clear. I'm going to be clear again. I don't know how many times I said on Sunday, pending the state's approval, and I said it again yesterday. I also said we would be ready for Wednesday morning. We're not going to put out a plan, seek approval from the state, and then not be ready to implement it. We are ready to implement it starting tomorrow morning. We are waiting for an answer from the state. We cannot act until we get an answer from the state. It's as clear as that. And I'm urging the state to move quickly and be decisive. We, we are at a moment where we need action. We're not going to defy the state. I've never suggested that in the least. I said I put a proposal on the table to the state. We will be ready to implement it but we are waiting for sign-off. Oh, thank you. Um, so what kind of outreach is being done now? Because I know last night you were asked uh, that this is a pretty confusing situation. I think you said that it isn't, but I think for a lot of businesses in these areas, it is confusing. So what kind of outreach is being done? Is SBS involved? Are people telling businesses, you know, people might now forget what's non-essential and, and they might forget if their business is, is essential or what way it can open. So what kind of outreach is being done no. if that does? Happen. Yeah, no, I, I want to say I really have empathy for business owners. They've been through so much. This is the last thing they need. It's the last thing they want to hear. I appreciate that. And, and I want to see these businesses survive. And the notion of even having to close them for a few weeks is painful for everyone. I have empathy for them. And I agree they don't have the clear information they need. I want to get them the clear information they need. But we had to get this situation addressed. And so I put the proposal out publicly to move the ball, to get things to happen, because my job is to protect people in this city. And we're going to have a decision soon. I'm convinced of that. We will educate everyone in the communities immediately when we have that decision. Clearly, the word has spread. So by putting the proposal out on Sunday, it gave people a chance to hear it and get ready for it. We will then, the second we have a final decision from the state, we'll start educating communities. We'll make clear to people what's expected of them. I want to be very, very clear. We do not want to harm anybody. We want to help stop this disease from spreading to more and more of the city. 
So we'll get the word out and then we'll start enforcement. Once we've gotten the word out to everyone, we'll start enforcement right away. And at that point, it will be very, very aggressive because when those restrictions are in place, it'll be crystal clear what's expected of everyone. Everybody, as we close down today, I just want to say this. Look, this city has come so far and we came so far by focusing on the data by focusing on the science. This is what has differentiated New York City from so much of the rest of the United States and even from a lot of other countries around the world. Devotion to following what the actual facts tell us to do. We saw a problem in these last days. It unfortunately consolidated. It was time to say we needed stronger restrictions. So our decisions are based on the data and the science. But in the end, what really changes things, what protects everyone, is when the people get involved. New Yorkers are the people who turned the tide last time. Under the toughest circumstances, New Yorkers will do it again. So it's the science and the people. And I think this is what was never understood, unfortunately, in Washington, D.C., and in a lot of places around the country. Devotion to the science, and then belief in the people. Once you educate the people, it's up to the people to then take those lessons and act on them. And here in New York City, New Yorkers did that. We're going to do that again, and we're going to keep this city safe. Thank you, everybody.